according to the UN, we lose the equivalent of one soccer field worth of soil to erosion every five seconds. We are in the midst of a global soil crisis, and unsustainable agriculture is a main driver for it. When Yotam and I met 15 years ago, we were studying environmental studies. One of our courses was in sustainable agriculture. Our teacher, Dr. Elaine Soloway, walked us through every aspect of what is wrong with the way our current food system is designed. It was eye-opening. It was also incredibly troubling. I remember going home from uni one day and talking to a family member about what I've learned. His response was, well, yes, but to feed the billions of people on the planet, we have no other choice. We've heard this argument again and again. This is the story industrial farming tells us. But we wondered, is that really true? What if there were ways to grow lots of food and build healthy soil in the process? Young and naive, Yotam and I left uni with a decision that changed our lives. We are going to be farmers. Cultures all over the world and here found ways to feed themselves while taking care of their environment. We had been very fortunate to have had many teachers that helped us learn, develop and refine our growing practices. In 2014, we started our own market garden, Pakaraka Permaculture, with the burning desire to see how much food can we grow on a quarter acre using truly sustainable, organic and regenerative techniques. We fenced a piece of land that previously supported two sheep. <laughs> now, we grow over 10 tons of fresh vegetables, providing fresh food for hundreds of people. The layout of the garden was the first opportunity for us to think about best soil practice. On our slopey site, it meant creating permanent beds on contour. Growing on contour means that the beds are shaped perpendicular to the slope. This helps slow down water flow, reduce soil runoff, and increase water retention in the landscape. Permanent beds means that the bed stays a bed, and the path stays a path, and they don't mix. This means we don't have to till our soil to recreate them every season. By not tilling, we're maintaining healthy soil structure, which is the habitat for so many creatures that rely on it to survive and thrive. This is known as no-till gardening, and it's a growing movement. With no-till practices and minimal soil disturbance, carbon stays in the soil. Carbon is key in, develop in developing healthy soil structure, feeding and diversifying the soil's living community, and enhancing the soil's ability to hold water. So how do we prepare beds for optimal plant growth? We fork. <laughs> Forking <laughs> is just as effective as digging or tilling at aerating the soil. But it has many advantages. It not, it's, it's not only easier, it's also, it also doesn't disturb the layers of the soil, it doesn't invert the layers of the topsoil, which are much better left intact. Forking a bed for the first time, <laughs> we take small bites, making our way backwards. With every forking sequence, it becomes easier and easier as we take care not to compact the beds by stepping on them or driving heavy machinery. At this point, we only need to fork our beds once a season. We like to take credit for the work we do as gardeners, of course. But the truth is that plants and microorganisms take care of each other. As plants photosynthesize, they release some of the sugars they make directly into the soil through root exudates. Not only that, but the plants can curate a special mix to attract beneficial microorganisms and deter harmful ones. In return, the microorganisms synthesize nutrients in the soil to make them more plant-friendly or bioavailable. And that's why an active, living soil community is the heart of a productive garden. When we look at a garden bed, we ask ourselves, how can we grow in it as many plants as possible? We want to create a living ground cover that the plants themselves act as mulch. We aim to have the bed fully, co fully covered as quickly as possible, 
to reduce weed pressure and water evaporation, essentially creating a microclimate that protects the soil and is enjoyed by the plants. If we're growing a slow crop that won't quickly cover the bed by itself, we will interplant it with a fast-growing crop. By planting multiple successions, we don't need to stretch each plant beyond its limits. Instead, we can plan for reliable production and boost the yields across the season. The cool thing is that planting in these ways means that we're getting more vegetables from every single bid. In our gardens, we only use organic practices. We never use chemical fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, fungicides. When chemical inputs are introduced, they harm the surrounding ecology as well as the soil's living community. So besides growing a variety of vegetables, we've also planted herbs, perennials, and flowers in and around the garden to create a more complex ecosystem, provide shelter to small predators that help with pest control, and keep pollinators happy with year-round blooms. In our journey, we learned lots and lots by trial and error, and we keep experimenting to get better results from the same space. In our first year, we grew $20,000 worth of vegetables. In our second year, we grew $50,000 worth of vegetables. Last year, our seventh growing season, we grew over $120,000 and 10 tons of fresh vegetables from our quarter-acre garden. Thank you. It is incredibly exciting that while our yields keep increasing, the health of our soil is improving on every measurable scale. It is possible to make a living from a small piece of land while prioritizing caring for the earth, for the people, and creating abundance. We sell our vegetables within our local community, through markets, local shops and cafes, and with veggie boxes. And we're building, cultivating, and strengthening the relationship between the gardens, the growers, and the people that enjoy the produce. We established an education center and wrote a comprehensive regenerative gardening book so that we can share all of our gardening skills with as many people as possible, so that anyone who can and wants to grow food in their homes and communities will have access to all of the same tools that we have. And we're not alone. <laughs> the research tells us that Smaller farms have higher yields and boost greater crop and non-crop biodiversity than larger farms. Farms like ours are growing food and building soil all over the world. So going back to that conversation I had 15 years ago, I now know we do have a choice. If we want to feed the billions of people on the planet now and in the future, we have to tell a different story about the future of agriculture. By decentralizing food production and supporting regenerative and organic growers, in 15 years from now, we can have a future where food grown while nurturing the soil instead of depleting it is the norm and not the exception. Since we started this talk alone, around the world, we lost around 100 soccer fields worth of topsoil. That's 700 times the size of our gardens. A garden the size of one soccer field can feed thousands of people with fresh vegetables. Humanity is capable of providing for itself while providing for the planet. Whether you've, if you've got access to two square meters or 20, you could be growing some of your own food for yourself, your family, and your community. If you fall or fell in love with gardening like we did and have access to a quarter acre, two acres or more, you could also be feeding hundreds of people and perhaps thousands. We see a future where the majority of fresh vegetables are grown in people's fronts and backyards, community gardens and market gardens, where fresh food is never far away and is accessible to more people everywhere. Thank you. Thank you.